computer. I better check the sound. Joyce has had this before uh, since I've used it, so she could have changed some settings. So let's let's check. Test speaker microphone. Okay. Yes, I hear the ringtone. Speak and pause. <laughs> okay. We're good. <laughs> All right. So we're in chapter two. And get the slideshow on the road. There we go. All right. Oh, we just introduced chemistry last time. Now we're going to look at uh, some basic stuff that's, that's really uh, measurements and calculations. Uh, once you learn this stuff, you can use it in any of the sciences. It's common to every one of them, chemistry, physics, physical science, uh, even biological sciences. These are standard measurement and calculation things that are standard to, to all of them. And then we'll take a look at matter. Um, uh, first is to recognize that whenever you go in the, the lab or out in nature and you make a measurement of something, you're going to get two things. You're going to get a number and you're going to get a unit of measure. A number without a unit of measure, as far as measurement goes, means nothing. If I say that, that my height is six, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, you might assume that it's six feet, but you don't know, right? You need the unit of measure. In fact, I'm not six feet, I'm 5'11". But if I said 5'11", intuitively, you'd know that I mean five feet, 11 inches. So that's why I chose six. But there's always a number and a measurement that goes with it. Now, um, if we change the size of the measurement, you know, instead of uh, six feet, I said 72. My height didn't change, right? Just the, the size of the measurement changed, right? So for six feet, you would it'd be six feet to the top. But if we're talking about inches, it'd be 72 inches to the top, right? So the, the physical presence of whatever you're measuring does not change. It's just the characteristic of the measurement that changes. So that means if you make a measurement of say my height, six, we can say safely, use this one, that six feet equals 22 inches. Because physically, that's true. This is the same as that. Okay, I'll come back to that topic in a few minutes. Okay, uh, this is also known as a quantitative observation. Um, in sciences, we have quantitative observations and qualitative observations. Sometimes they kind of blend. Uh, but some scientists are more quantitative, like physics. It's, it's basically almost all quantitative. <clears throat> uh, whereas chemistry is kind of in between. Some of our observations and measurements are qualitative. Like we might say solution turned blue. Or we saw it was clear to start with, but when we added this stuff to it, we got this cloudy white stuff that started to settle and then it settled out. It's called a precipitate. That's a qualitative observation. <clears throat> but if we, if we conduct that experiment, and we know how much stuff we started with, we add a solution to it, and then we let it settle, and then we filter it and collect the solid stuff, you know, and then put it in the oven and dry it for a while, and then stick it on the balance and measure how much does it weigh, that's a quantitative measurement that is associated with the same experiment. 
Okay, the two parts, number and unit. Um, the unit always defines the scale. In other words, if the scale is uh, large, then the unit will be large, like one foot. If the scale is small, it would be inches. But it could be very, very small. It could be very, very large. Like we could say, my height is so many miles, right? <laughs> That'd be kind of dumb, but mathematically it's doable because there is a conversion that you can make between feet and miles, right? 5,280 feet is a mile. So we divide that by 5280 and we get my height in miles. <clears throat> okay, so when we're dealing with numbers like this and what we call standard notation, right? It's just a number, sometimes the decimal points involved. Um, sometimes those numbers get very large or very small. And they're difficult to deal with. Right? So we have a way of dealing with them called scientific notation. Now scientific notation itself is a subset of exponential notation. Right. In order to have to be exponential notation, all you need is to take your number. Let's use an example. Let's say um, you know, that's 93 million miles from here to the sun. But let's use a different one. How about we have a, a large number that's a uh, million uh, seven hundred thirty-two thousand five hundred four. Okay. Exponential notation. All you have to do is to have a power of 10 times what's left over. Okay. So if we say we, we say the decimal point is understood to be here, so if we move it three places to the left, that would leave us with that number. Well, and the decimal point, which moved over here. But moving it three places, we store up that thousand, right? Ones, tens, thousand. We store up that thousand in the power of ten. Okay, so that's a valid exponential notation. This is called the coefficient. Right? Coefficient. And this is the power. Okay, that's valid exponential notation, but it's not scientific notation. In order to be scientific that x, the coefficient has to be between the one and 10. Okay. So to make it scientific, we have to move it three more places, right? Because now the decimal point is here and that value is between the one and 10. 1.73354 times 10 to the what? Well, we already have three places stored up, so we move three more. That means we need six total. We move to three more places. So if you move the decimal to the left, the power is positive. Okay. If we have a number like um, 0 0.00732, just for argument's sake, and we tried to make scientific notation out of that, we would move one, two, three, four places. Moving to the right, your power becomes a negative. And then it would be 7.32 times 10 to minus 4. That's scientific notation. Okay. What happens if your coefficient, say you have a number that's um, Like that. And we say, oh, between 1 and 10, let's say 10 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, I say between 1 and 10, not 10. Right? So if you make it to 10, you need to go one step further. Your coefficient cannot be 10, it can be 9.999. 
whatever. But it can't be tenable. To be scientific notation. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now let's see. Oh, what are they going to do to us now? Since you already have the PowerPoints in front of you, you probably know what's coming, but I don't look at mine, so mystery. Uh, we already did that. So the power of 10 can be positive or negative, depending on your standard notation number. If it's a very small number, like, like a very small decimal fraction, Intu intuitively, you should know that the power of 10 is going to be a negative number. But if it's a huge number, large, where lots of, lots of uh, numbers to the left of the decimal, then you know that your power of 10 should be a positive number. Right? A good habit to get into with, well, actually, math or any of the sciences is estimation. You want to be have confidence in your answer for any problem, whether it's on a test or whether you're actually out there being paid to do something. So you want to have confidence in your answer. And one of the ways is to just to do a rough estimate. You know, sometimes that's just, um, say you have, uh, uh, so, uh, Okay, so this is close to one, and that's close to seven. So your answer is probably going to be greater than seven because of these fractions. So if your answer is not greater than seven and not extremely large, then you should be fairly confident that your answer is correct. That's estimation. So let's see what it would really be. 9.8. All right, so it is greater than 7, and it's not too large. Um, a friend of mine, when I was uh, working, going to school at, at LSU in Baton Rouge, he was in mechanical engineering as a student. He says it always surprised him, his fellow students. Uh, had, they'd studied a chapter, right, and they were going in to take an exam. And he said, they read a word problem, and they pick out the numbers, and they cram them into the formulas that they had studied for that chapter. And the answer would come out like 34 billion. <laughs> it was a description of something that should be smaller, you know, like, like, like uh, 3.45, something or other. Right? And they were just given the answer and, of course, get it wrong. They had no concept of reality. 34 billion is impossible answer for this question. Right? So if they had just estimated or at least been in touch with reality, they know that their answer was wrong. So estimation, another way of saying it is don't lose your connection to reality. Right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and we've talked about that already. Uh, move to the left. You're storing up positive power of 10. Move to the right. You're storing up negative powers of 10. Those are examples. Um, okay. So what would this be in scientific notation? That's standard notation, right? So we know where the decimal <coughs> is understood to be, just to the right of the two. So which way would the decimal move? Right. So we're storing up positive values of 10. And we actually have three, 10 to the third. And the decimal now is located between the seven and the eight. 7.882 times 10 to the third. And that should be this one. Okay, how about this one? That's 
just the opposite scenario, right? You're moving to the right because you're trying to find the coefficient that's between one and 10. And in order to do that, you've got to move the decimal over here between four and nine. You don't want to go to the nine and six because now your coefficient <laughs> is too large. So we moved it how many places? One, five. two, five places. So it'd be 4.96 times 10 to the minus five. Okay. Um, this is just a review. Um, here's a good point. Some types of measurements, if, um, if you measure something with a, like a meter stick or you measure something on the balance, the unit of measure is going to be, uh, what's the best word for this? It's going to be a single unit. On the balance, it'll be grams. Meter stick might be centimeters or millimeters or whatever. But there are some instruments now that are that are able to take your substance, make a measurement on it, and give you a value that's a compound unit of measure. Right? This is an example of that. Joule is a single measurement. Seconds is a measurement of time. But it's still a valid unit of measure for that number, joule seconds. The other way that you can get compound units is through calculation. So after you've made the measurement, you might make several measurements pertaining to uh, an object or a process. And when you combine those in a calculation, you'll end up with a compound unit. That's perfectly valid. They can be either uh, in the numerator, joule time seconds, or you could have um, like this one, meters per second. That's an expression of velocity. Okay. Or if you look at your speedometer as you're driving down the road, you know, they've usually got two scales on them now. One is miles per hour and the other is kilometers per hour. So you're still going the same speed, but one measurement says you're going this many units uh, with those units of measure, and the other one says you're going this many units with the other. So if you're going 55, I think, kilometers per hour is around 100. I like that. Oh, I hit the wrong button. I hit the uh, mute button. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to point that out. You don't have to have a single unit be a valid unit of measure. Okay, so if we're going to have units of measure, scientists need to agree upon uh, some of the units of measure. They need to be standardized so that if I say seconds to you, you know what I mean. Or the devices that you use will give you units here, the same as they do for me back in my home country. Um, and the system that was devised was SI, which is French for international system. Okay, they do everything backwards in France. That's why they're in so much trouble, I guess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but these are the um, fundamental units, call them. These have a standard that's associated with them and it's the same everywhere in the universe. Okay. So the mass standard is the kilogram. And K is there for the kilo, which means 1,000 times a gram. Now this is, a lot of these were our legacy units. In other words, before they were standardized, the unit of measure was the gram. Right, so it's a little tiny thing. But it's difficult to standardize something that small. Right? If you have uh, the platinum iridium alloy that's used to standardize the, the mass, um, if it's that small and you miss weigh it <laughs> by a tenth of a gram, you're off by 10%. Right? So they said, okay, we need something bigger. But the gram's already embedded in our language. So we're going to call it the kilogram. 
So now the cylinder is like this, right? made out of platinum iridium, stuck in a triple layer bell jar with inert gas in it. And they keep it in some cave in France because it's stable temperature. So if you want to standardize your kilogram, then you've got to go over there and make detailed comparisons or send it to them. They'll do it for you for, for a price. Nothing's free. And they'll say, this is your kilogram compared to our kilogram is really, you know, uh, 1.0000000005 kilograms. A little bit heavy. Okay. But then you know exactly how much your kilogram weighs. And when you standardize your equipment using that kilogram uh, in your home country, you know uh, that your standard value needs to be adjusted for that. So that's the standard of mass. Standard of length is the meter. Right? And the meter was originally a certain fraction of the distance between the equator and the North Pole. If you measured it going through the prime meridian, which is through uh, uh, Greenwich, England, was the the position for the prime meridian. So if you go north to the North Pole, south to the equator, that has a certain distance, and then we'll take a fraction of that, that's our meter. Then once you've got that value, then you uh, take that same alloy, platinum meridian, and you make a physical meter. And then you store it in that same cave, protected from the elements. Use that as your standard. That's the way they did it for many, many years. <laughs> Until an alternate was devised that gives you the same result as the meter, but you can get that result anywhere in the, in the universe. And if you have the right equipment and it's not cheap, then you can measure and produce a meter as so many wavelengths of a laser light produced by a certain element. That's your meter. So you can standardize your own equipment now using that device. Uh, the second, that's another legacy unit. It's an astronomical unit. Uh, we just, now we take that second and we standardize it out to like 45 decimal points. Right? And it's important to know exactly what the second is, particularly now that with uh, GPS, because the timing of a signal from one of those GPS satellites is absolutely essential to 10 or 12 decimal point accuracy in order to give you a position on the earth that's within a meter. Okay, so time is, standard is the second. Temperature is the Kelvin. Now, the weatherman in this country says, the temperature is so much degrees Fahrenheit. We understand that. Scientists use centigrade or Celsius. I can never remember which. Same thing. Same unit of measure. <clears throat> um, so there's a conversion that you can make between Fahrenheit and centigrade. I'll give you the formula. Um, but once you have centigrade, Kelvin is, is easy to calculate. It's just an adjustment of the zero point. So you just have to add 273 to your centigrade value and you get Kelvin. That's because the size of the degree in centigrade is the same as it is in Kelvin. Right? So all you have to do is just move the zero point. Right? That's the fundamental unit of temperature. Electric current, you won't have to deal with that, not in this class. My general chems do in the second semester. The ampere. Ampere is so many coulombs passing a point. It's current. So many coulombs of electricity passing a point in one second. That's an ampere. That's one coulomb, actually. Um, the amount of a substance, yes, you need to know this one. And we'll talk about that one in more detail later, actually, what the mole means. But it's just a number. It's like so many things, right? So the mole. It's this value that you can put in front of anything. 
number of atoms, number of ions, number of molecules, number of chickens for that matter. It's just a number. Okay, so those are fundamental units. Everything else is derived from those, either com combining one or more of them or uh, changing the size of the unit. So if you have a kilogram and you want a thousand of that size, you just have the gram because you already have a thousand times. So a thousand of it is just the gram. <clears throat> but if you have a meter, and you want to measure things in large units, like the kilometer, then you need to multiply a meter times a thousand to get your, your uh, derived unit of measure. And these are the prefixes. If you put one of these prefixes in front of a fundamental unit, it changes the size of the scale. Okay. So one that's common, is, well, we've talked about the kilo, which is a thousand times. Uh, milli is a thousandth of, right? So a millimeter, like if the meter's here, a millimeter's like that, okay? It's a thousandth of a meter, is your unit now. Micro, when you start getting down into um, microbiological sizes, you know, the size of a cell, then you, you, in terms of micro, and the symbol is this Greek letter mu, stands for micro. The M was already taken from milli, so we had to think of something else. So we turn to the Greek and they say, okay, sounds like M, but it's not M, so we say mu. So this, the unit of measure then is that micrometer. a millionth of. So one micrometer is equal to 10 to the minus six meters. Okay, that's an equivalence. These are exactly the same size units. That one is one of them. This is a millionth of that one to give you the same size. That's what the equal means. Right? Whenever you see an equivalence like that, we'll talk about it in a minute, you can create a conversion factor that will allow you to convert either one to the other. Right, just pull that back here for a little bit. And we'll, we'll get to it. Nano is a billion, 10 to the minus ninth. So some your uh, the exercise, some of the exercise clothing is impregnated with nanoparticles. But they have certain characteristics that are desirable like for how they wick away sweat, how they allow you to breathe but not collect a lot of water as, as you exercise. Some of those things. But the scale is on the nano. So nanotechnology is anything at that scale. Okay, so if the fundamental length is a meter, then a kilometer is actually 1,000 meters. Uh, deci is one tenth, so a little d is a deci. If you say four, you might have did we see a d? Is there a big d? Deci. There wasn't a big d. Big d means deca, which is just ten times. Little d is deci, which is one tenth of. Centi, like the centimeter, is a hundredth of a meter. There you go. Just, we've already talked about that. Unless you have questions. <clears throat> this is trying to, okay. Um, length, if you're looking at a cube, length is just one side of the cube, right? So you could get the area on the side of that cube by this one times that one, right? But if you want volume, you got to have all three dimensions. Right? So if we have one meter this way, one meter that way, and one meter that way, one times one times one is one cubic meter. But what if we take a length that's only a decimeter or a tenth 
of a meter on the side. Then you get one cubic decimeter. And we have a derived unit that expresses that decimeter with just a single letter. It's called the liter. A liter is equal to one cubic decimeter. The probably one you're more familiar with if you're in the uh, medical profession is the millimeter or the cubic centimeter. They're equivalent. So if you get down to um, one centimeter here on the side of that cube, then you have, you're talking about one cubic centimeter. And I don't know, maybe some hospitals that have lots of, uh, have stored up a lot of consumables um, will still have some things that are calibrated in cc's, cubic centimeter. Right? But all the modern, I mean, if, if you bought within the past, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, it'll be labeled in millimeters. But they're exactly equivalent. The reason they were marked CCs is because it's kind of hard to, to print powers on your uh, syringes. Right? So they say CC instead of CM to the third. But now everybody seems to be happy with millimeters. And notice that M is milli, one thousandth of, and big L is liter. So if you see it written like this, that's wrong, right? That's milli something, I don't know what the hell it is, but it's not liters. This is milliliters. <clears throat> In fact, I've seen some textbooks with big N, little M and little L. That's because the editors don't know science. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Mass. Okay. This is sort of a legacy item too. When I say we go into the lab and we weigh something, we're actually going to determine its mass. So I, I can't break myself of the habit of saying weigh. We're going to weigh something. Weighing is the measure of a force. Mass is the amount of a substance. Right. They're two separate, they're related, but separate quantities. Mass relates to how much of it is there there. What's its inertia? You know, it's got a lot of mass, has a lot of inertia, so when you push on it, it doesn't move very much. If it has a little mass and you push on it, it goes. Um, but when I say weigh something, uh, therefore, a time, and they probably still do it, um, mass was used in sentences as a verb. Right? So, mass your beaker. It just doesn't sound right to me. So, I still say way. But I mean, determine its mass. That'd probably be a better way to do it. If you've got instructions for a lab experiment, say, determine the mass of, instead of weigh it. Get around that. But what a balance actually does is it compares. Well, the term balance, uh, everybody remember, ever ride a seesaw as a kid? Oh, yeah, love seesaw. There's a fulcrum in the middle, it's just a lever, right? So you have a seat on this side and a seat on this side. And uh, most of them have little things in here like this, so you can move it, right? If you, or you have some adult move it, this kid is probably too heavy. But if you've got a big person sitting over here, and a little person sitting over here, you know that you need more leverage here to balance things out. So you move the fulcrum over there, right? Okay. So when we talk about an analytical balance or a laboratory balance. Originally, the balances were mechanical and you had uh, standardized mass objects in there that would be moved onto or off of part of the balance. 
and your unknown would be over here, like your beaker containing something. Then you would put weights over here that are standardized, like one gram, right? If it's perfectly balanced, and we, we put this back in the center point, if it's perfectly balanced, you know that weighs one gram, right? And the law of levers, if you if you want to move it over here, then you have to take into account the, the ratio of the lever arms. But anyway, <clears throat> the point is that the term balance comes from the original balances were actually levers. And in fact, the first analytical balance I ever used in school was a mechanical balance. It was made by Mettler Corporation. Got that Y and stood up like this. And you, you rotate these knobs, and you could hear the clicks as you were putting weights onto or removing weights off of with the mechanism inside of the balance. Nowadays, though, we've interpreted those uh, forces because you're comparing the force of this one against the force of that one in a gravitational field. And as long as the gravitational field is the same for both, then if they weigh the same, they have the same mass. Okay. It's just if, if one, if this were in the uh, in the Earth's gravitational field, and you had a big enough lever arm, and this one was in the Moon's gravitational field, all bets are off. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but now the balances are electronic, which just means that the device that sits underneath that pan is a strain gauge. In other words, it measures the force that's being applied to it and it spits out a, uh, a current. You know, as you put mass on it, uh, it'll send out a higher current, the more mass you have. And that's interpreted as the mass of the object. Okay. They're very accurate, very reliable over long periods of time, uh, and more compact. Okay, so we have conversion factors, right? If you have a, a mass of one kilogram, uh, it will produce the same force equivalent to 2.2 pounds. <clears throat> now that equivalence mathematically is correct. Physically it's not, because that's a mass and that's a force. But mathematically speaking, we can make those conversions. That's not a, not a problem. And I'll show you how to do it in just a few. As long as I don't talk too long and run out of time. 1040 is it for you? Okay. No, 940. 940. Okay, I better jump on my horse and join this. Um, okay, so here's, here's a, a test of intuition or estimation. One gallon of milk is equal to about four liters of milk. Do we know what, do we have an idea of what a liter is? What size is that bottle? What does it say? It gives it this in is, ounces. This is 500 milliliters. 500 milliliters, so that's half of a liter because a liter is 1,000 milliliters. Okay. So that's a half a liter. So, how many of those would it take to fill up a gallon? Well, if that's a true statement, it would take eight of those, right? Because four liters, and that's only a half of one, so it would take eight of them. Is that true, though? Have you ever looked at the side of a, a gallon of milk? Because they all list in, in English units and metrics now. Like, that's so many ounces. It's also got milliliters on the side. You look. 17 ounces, okay. If you look on a, a gallon jug of milk, it'll say on there, one gallon, and then in parentheses, probably 3.8 liters. So that's a true statement. It's about. And if you think of that as a half a liter, so one liter would be like this. You've seen those liter bottles of Coke that are way overpriced. Mm -hmm. um, 
it takes four of those and you can make a gallon. If you sort of visually inspect what four of them would look like, yeah, it's about a gallon. Or if you have a two liter bottle, right, you just need two of those. Put two of those together. Yeah, I could fill up a gallon jug with those. So that's an estimate. How about a 200 pound man has a mass of 90 kilograms? We were given a conversion, right? One kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So if we say two times that would be 180, that's pretty close. I'd say, yeah. But this one, a basketball player has a height of seven meters. So a meter is a little more than a yard. So is a basketball player seven yards tall or 21 feet? <laughs> no, I don't think so. How about a nickel? 6.5 centimeters. What's a centimeter? Well, I'll give you this one. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Okay. So one inch. Well, it's, it's too big because a nickel's like It's too thick, isn't it? Because a nickel is only about that thick, which is like a maybe a fourth or even an eighth. You know, probably closer to an eighth of an inch. So that one's wrong too. Okay, just doesn't fit. <clears throat> okay. Now, when scientists write a number, they make a measurement, and they report a number for that measurement, the convention is, uh, let's say we have something like that. And, well, let's just put the units on it, centimeters. It's understood that we have supreme confidence in these values right here. Those are called the certain digits. Okay. The last one, one scientist reporting to another one, the last one is always the uncertain. And the reason we do it that way is we recognize that in every measurement, there is uncertainty. Only lawyers can say exact. And they say that because that's wins in cases. Okay. But in science, we know that there is uncertainty in every measurement. So when you make a measurement, the last digit that you put up there should be an estimate of that position. For instance, well, let's see, do I have an example here? Uh, yeah, okay. So if we look at uh, this one, we have markings down here for tenths of a centimeter. Those are centimeters and these are tenths. So we can say uh, right down to, what is that? 2.8, okay, 2.8 is certain. Because our device has, is marked off, calibrated for that. It has, it has a line there. But the last one we want to estimate is where? Well, is it? Well, wait a minute. Okay, they've, they, they've stuck some marks in here. That's not right. It should be an estimate. The last one should be an estimate because this is 0 0.8 times 2.8, and this one is 2.9, and we want to estimate the last one as a half of between the two. Okay. Oh, so, I think that's what the five is for. It's the in between. Yeah. But the way they've done it, if we take a uh, microscope and look at that, and we actually see those numbers there, then those are those are certain as well. So we would want to estimate if it's sitting right on the five, you would estimate the last one is zero. Okay. Okay. So that's the convention for recording measurements.
Okay, <clears throat> so when we make these measurements, there's another concept. You may have already been introduced to this before. The difference between accuracy and precision. Now, in popular literature and the news reports, these are synonymous. When they say something is more precise, what they probably mean is more accurate. So, but in science, there's a difference. Accuracy requires that you either know the true value that you're trying to measure. Yeah. This thing is exactly 2.85 centimeters long. And when you make a measurement, how close you are to that actual measurement determines the accuracy. But that's difficult. That information, the true, is difficult to come by. More often than not, it's the accepted value. So the accepted value is means that a whole bunch of people made their measurements and we averaged them together. That's the accepted value. How close are you to that value? Um, precision just refers to multiple measurements. How close are those multiple measurements together? Is it tight or is it spread out? Do you make lots of big errors, right? Makes an imprecise measurement. Whereas with multiple measurements, if it's very precise, each time you make a measurement, they'll be very close together. So, what does this one look like? Well, if you take the average, the average of those values is pretty close to there, right? So we say it's accurate. The measurement, the multiple measurements together, taken together, gives us an accurate average. But they're so spread out, it's not precise. Anybody here a uh, gun enthusiast? Okay. So when you, when you fire your gun and you're, say you're sighting in your scope, right? First thing you want is a tight pattern. No matter where it is on the target, you want to be sure that your gun's shooting true to some point. Okay, so a small spread is precision. Let's see, so the next one's precision. And yeah, maybe so. But you want a small spread. Then what you do is you make adjustments to your scope to move that spread to the bullseye. <clears throat> so in this case, it's not accurate because the average of the values puts it out here, away from the bullseye. But the pattern is fairly close together, so it's precise. This is the ideal. It's very accurate, right on the bullseye, plus it's a tight pattern. So it's both accurate and precise. And then the last case is it's neither. <laughs> Where are my marks? Uh, they're, they're on red, so it's kind of hard to see them. Oh, there's there's one there, one there, one there, and one there. So you average those together, nowhere near the bullseye, and the pattern is so spread out, it's not precise either. Okay. Those are your four choices. What we want Ideally, when we make measurements uh, in an experiment is this one. You want it to be precise and accurate. And it depends on what type of experiment you're doing, what discipline you're in, as to whether you can expect, you know, a really tight pattern close to the true value. Or if you're in a profession or a research profession like I was in, agriculture, where you put your experiments out in the field where the environmental conditions are doing this, you're lucky to get within 10% of your values when you measure it. Those are good results. So that's why when we do field experiments, we do them for three, four, five years at a time so that we can average all the, right, and, and try to remove uh, environmental influences or at least minimize their impact. Okay, that's where statistics comes in. I already asked this class, right? You're not, nobody in here? Okay. <laughs> Let's, don't worry about it now. 
Okay, so um, how do we uh, manipulate these values that we know have certain and uncertain figures? Well, we use this concept called significant figures. Significant are those, think of significant figures are those that you can keep after you do a calculation. You have to know how many you have to start with, and then when you do a calculation, uh, based on what I started with, how many am I allowed to keep? Well, we won't be honest. So first we say, how do we count significant figures? Well, non-zero integers in a measurement are always significant. Anything from one to nine is a significant digit. Okay. So this one has four significant figures. They're all non-zero. Those are the easy ones. If you've got a number with all non-zeros, you're good to go. But if there's a zero stuck in there, we got to know where is the zero as to whether it's significant or not. Because sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. So there are three classes of zeros. Let's start from the left, from this side. If you have zeros leading into a number, they are not significant, right? And you won't have zeros without a decimal point. It's, it's just stupid, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got a number that, if I wrote, uh, right, we assume the decimal point's there. So what are the zeros for? Zeros were invented uh, in, the, in the Arabic system as placeholders, right? There's no placeholder to be made there there's nothing there. Right? So anytime you see zeros to the left of a non-zero number, there's going to be a decimal point. But these zeros are not significant. They're never significant to the left of non-zero numbers. Now, you don't have any more non-zero numbers out here. You can't have. As long as they're all zeros to the left, they're not significant. Then we move over. What if we put one of these zeros between the four and the eight? Ah. Now, that zero is significant. Why? Because it's holding a place. If it's not there, then we don't have that number. We take that zero out, then we have 16.7. And that's a different number than 16.07. So that zero has to be significant. So now we have four significant figures in that number. So any zero that's bracketed by non-zeros is significant. Then the next case is zeros to the right. So zeros to the right are significant only if there's a decimal point. Right? Let's say we wrote that number this way. That. There's no explicit decimal there. There's an understood decimal here. But in terms of zeros and whether they're significant or not, there's no decimal. So those zeros are not significant. That one only has two significant figures. If we want to make those zeros significant, just put a decimal there. Now they're significant. <clears throat> the power of the decimal. Can you <laughs> um, okay, so this has four significant figures because there's a decimal. That one only has two. Now, if you put a decimal there, um, we just did it on a whim here. But when you're actually doing the measurement in your lab, um, the accuracy and the precision of your instrumentation will tell you whether you are permitted a zero there. So that's a different topic. So we can do this here because we're just hypotheticals. But in the lab, uh, your instrumentation will tell you whether you can put that decimal there or not. Now, 
There's another class of number called exact. And these are good to have because you don't have to worry about their significant figures. When you do a calculation with these, they have infinite significant figures. Okay? And these are usually conversion factors. When you use a number in there to convert from one unit to the next, that number has infinite significant figures. You don't have to worry about it. You only have to, you only have to be concerned with those that are, are true measurements, not conversion factors. And those determine what your uh, the significant figures of your answer, such as that one inch equals two point five four centimeters. That's an exact number. That's an exact number. So they have infinite significant figures. There's also counting, right? Uh, a fraction of a pencil doesn't make any sense. So when we say nine pencils, we mean nine power missing many significant figures you need, you got them. Right? Not just one, you can have a million if you need them with a counting number. Okay. So we talked about uh, exponential notation. The, the good thing about exponential notation is it forces you to determine how many significant figures you have because those significant figures are going to be preserved in the coefficient. So if this one is 300 point, the decimal, then you can preserve those in your coefficient, right? And as long as we have that decimal there, we know those two zeros are significant. But if we had this one, convert that to scientific notation. You can only keep the one because there's no explicit decimal. Okay. Um, and if you have zeros in there that are not significant, you don't have to keep them. Right? So if you have that's 5.4 times 10 to the minus. Five. You don't have to keep those zeros because they're not significant. But when you convert this uh, scientific notation back to standard notation, you got to stick those zeros in because they're otherwise <laughs> that number doesn't mean anything. Okay, so it's not like you lost them. It's just that they're they're out here in the ether somewhere, and you can bring them back when you need them. They're just not significant. Now we've gone to all this trouble to define what's significant and what's not, so that I can give you some more rules. <laughs> what do you do when you're calculating with significant figures? Oh, uh, sorry, we have to round off first. There are a whole host of different ways to round numbers. We're going to take the simple approach. If it's five or greater, you round the next number to the left up. If it's less than five, Four or less, then the number to the left is rounded down. I would just leave it alone. For instance, okay, if we want to round this one off to that position, we look to the right, that's five or greater. Four. Okay, you still have to hold that place, right? But that rounds it. Say in your calculation, you're only permitted to keep, keep three significant figures in your answer. And I'll show you how to do that. But if that's the case, then we've got to round our answer to three significant figures, right? So to do that, we need to know one, two, three. So what is this one? Well, it's greater than five, five or greater. So that was four. So now we only have three significant figures. If we keep it this way, we've got four, and that's cheating. Right? If the rules say you can only have three, you have to round. If we were to round, if the calculation says you can only have two significant figures, right? One, two. That one's three. So now you can only keep those two. Okay. 
keep forgetting them being recorded. I need to write bigger. Okay. Um, and one thing you don't want to do is when you're rounding, if we need to go to, that's a bad example. Let's say, let's say this is a, uh, this is a five. No, let's say it's a four. Here we go. What did I just say? <laughs> right. Big. There we go. So it comes and shows up. If we're going to round to two significant figures, you don't round this one over here. And then round this one. Right? You don't sequentially round. You only round based on what's to the right of the position you're rounding to. Right? That introduces an error. Okay, so let's get to the rules for... Okay, this, this, um, I may have stuck this one in here. When you do a series of calculations, and this is this is valid for multiplication and division because of the way significant figures rules work. And this statement I'm going to make probably won't make a lot of sense until we get to the rules for calculations. But multiplication and division, as you're calculating, if you have a series of numbers that have to be multiplied and or divided, put them into your calculator and let the calculator spit out the biggest number it can. That's fine. Then you go to the end and you say, in that series of calculations, what's the limit on my number of significant figures? Once you determine that limit, then you round the final answer. What that does is it makes significant errors less likely. Because if you round each step, suppose every time you round, you round up, 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 up then your error is way out here. So multiplication and division, anytime you have a series of multiplication and division, let your calculator um, just spit out the biggest number it can and then uh, round it again. Okay, so we have two types of rules that, are op that operate in significant figures calculation. One refers to multiplication and division that's the easier one, actually. So if you have, uh, in this case, two numbers, one of them has four significant figures, the other has two, then you multiply those together and your calculator says, okay, this is the value I think it is, but you know that you can only keep two because the least significant figures determines the answer. So two is the limit. Your answer can have no more than two significant figures. So if your calculator says 1.342 times 5.5 is 7.381, you know that you can only keep two of those. So you round to the second position here, and that makes 7.4 is your valid answer. Okay, if 5.5 is like 5 then you could have three. Yep. Then you would round to 7.38. <clears throat> and my lines are off. Should be shifted over here under those. Mm -hmm. The other set of rules pertains to addition and subtraction. Okay. So addition and subtraction, you are limited to the position of the decimal place. Okay. So for example, if you have this number, let me just write it up here. Then I can. There's a decimal. I'm going to line up the decimals and make an addition. Okay? So there's your decimal. What's the least number of decimal places here? Right there. Right? Okay? So when you add these together and your calculator says it's this. This, this, um, this, and this. 
then you know that you have to round to that decimal place. Okay. The addition subtraction is based upon the position of the decimal. Right, so we would round to 31.28, and that's your answer. Okay. Wait, so why did you? Why did I what? No. <laughs> yeah, I see now. I just drew that dotted line to show you that's the limit. You can't go past there in your answer. You have to stop it right there. Because the decimals now are lined up, and this decimal only goes out two places, tenths, hundredths. This one goes tens, hundreds, thousands, but you can't keep the thousands because this one is only two hundreds. Okay. It also occurred to me, I don't know if I put that one in here. Let's see. No, that's something else. So let's say, for instance, that you have uh, numbers that don't have a decimal, an explicit decimal point in them. Right? Let's just change a few things here. Let's say two, three, four, four, how about that? And then uh, 780, add those together, okay? We know that this only has two um, significant figures. That only has four, but we're adding, right? So we let the calculator do its dirty. There we go. 3124 is what it says the answer is. Right? But that's not significant. So we got around to this position. That's the answer. Right? The textbook doesn't talk about what to do if the decimal is understood. Right? So I threw this one in for fun. Now, this number only has two significant figures. That one has four, but the answer has three. That's one of the artifacts of addition subtraction rules. Right? You can't just say in addition subtraction, if this one only has two, then the answer can only have two. That only works for multiplication and division. For addition subtraction, you actually have to put the numbers in there and line them up and do the rule. Then you know the answer. Now, what do you do if your <clears throat> calculation, you have multiple calculations, um, and some of them are addition, subtraction, some of them are multiplication, division? Well, there you go. Those are the rules, right? You do everything inside the parentheses first. Then if there are exponents, you apply the exponents. Then you do multiplication divisions, and then addition subtraction, okay? So the uh, rules for multiplication division are here. The rules for add addition subtraction are there. You know, it just occurred to me, I never thought of this before, because nobody ever asked me. Parentheses, obviously, you know, you just do what's inside. But what if you have an exponent? How do you treat significant figures with an exponent? An exponent is just multiplication several times, right? So you use multiplication rule for exponent. Okay? It shouldn't really matter because in an exponent, every factor in the multiplication has the same number of significant figures, right? So it, it shouldn't matter much. But I just thought I'd throw that in there for giggles. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm, hey, can I built in a buffer for this one? We never review that if next Tuesday. But the, the chapter on matter is really short. Right. So this slide uh, speaks to the what do you do in the lab if you make two measurements using two different devices? One of them is more accurate than the other. 
your answer is limited to the accuracy of the least accurate device. Right? So this one determines the answer when you add these two together. That's all that means. The total volume is limited by this graduated cylinder. That's the whole point of that slide. So you have to know your instrumentation when you're making measurements. Which one is the least accurate because that's going to be the weak link in your chain. Uh, dimensional analysis. We do need to get to this one. All right. Let's say we have um, a number with a unit of measure, but it's the wrong unit of measure. We want a different one then you need to be able to convert from one unit to the next. Right? So let's see, do we have an example? Um, okay, you can read that at your leisure. Okay, 6.8 foot putt, which is pretty significant. Right? If you've ever played golf. 6.8 feet. And we want to convert that to inches, right? So they're going to be equal. I mean, it's the same distance, but now the units are going to be in inches rather than feet. So we need a way to convert that one to that one. Right? So we've got these two units, feet and inches. What, how are they related? Right? You need an equivalence, right? So one foot equals how many inches? Twelve. Twelve inches. Now we have our equivalents. We can create a conversion factor that will take us from here to here, as long as we have that equivalence. Right. Okay. Next concept. In algebra, it's valid to multiply anything times one. Right. So I multiply that by one, and I, I haven't changed it, but I still don't get my answer. So I need something that's equal to one, right? That I can stick in there that will give me my answer. So if I have this, what if I divide both sides by one foot? Okay. So in algebra, if you divide both sides by the same number, that's valid, you haven't changed it. So this is now 12 inches divided by one foot is equal to one foot divided by one foot. So this is equal to one, right? So if that's equal to one, I can put this right there. So if I say, well, that's I get too messy. Let's just put it in here. 12 inches divided by one foot is equal to one. And recall also that anytime you write a number or a unit and there's no explicit fraction described, like we don't have like this, it's always assumed to be in the numerator. Right? It's like this divided by one. Okay. So that means this is in the denominator, that's in the numerator, and the funny thing about, uh, well, the big term is dimensional analysis, but keeping track of your units is that if the units, if the unit multiplied by is in the numerator times one that's in the denominator, they cancel. Well, now we cancel the feet, but we still have the inches, which is what we want. So now that we've got the units correct, we can just multiply the numbers. That's in the numerator, that's in the numerator, so they're multiplied. And we should get my animations here. Come on, there, 82 inches. All right, 6.8. And remember, that is an exact number. You don't have to worry about that one for significant figures. This one determines the answer. Two significant figures, two significant figures. 
Okay. That's why conversion factors work, because they're equal to one. And you can chain them together. Right? If we really don't want to go to two inches, they we wanted to go to Well, we've got inches now, so we need a factor that'll cancel inches and leave us with centimeters. So one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Inches cancel, leave us with centimeters. Now we just multiply that one times that one times that one. These are both exact. We're still limited to two. And just whatever the answer is, we round to two significant figures and you got centimeters now. That's called a chain conversion. Oh, do you need to go to class? Um, I was in late Oh, okay, okay. I, I'm trying to remember which class it was where I had somebody that had to leave early. Yeah. I, I think it's you. Yeah, it <laughs> is me. What time is it? Uh, 9.30? 9.30. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So what I may do is uh, when we reach 9.40, uh, if you've got another class to go to or you have somewhere to go, go ahead. What I'll do is I'll keep recording and I'll just do a lecture on the next chapter. So it'll be there. I'll post it to Blackboard and you can watch it between now and, and Tuesday when we do a review. Okay. Shouldn't take long because it's a really short chapter. Okay, so here are some other conversion factors. Example. Um, I'm going to let you look at that one yourself. Um, here's an example of estimation. Anybody take a road trip? Not to Los Angeles. Well, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll tell, I've never been there either. My road trips are usually between here and, and the coast or here in Atlanta. My family is from. So you need to know what? How much money do I need to take, right? I need to have enough to buy gas so I can get back. And you squirrel that away so that you don't spend it on something down there and then you're stuck. How much money do I need to go from here to there? Well, what do you need to know? Well, the mileage that you would get on your car. Right, you need to know how far it is and the mileage. So the mileage is miles per gallon and miles per gallon will convert that miles distance into gallons of gas. The other thing about, I didn't make this point before, is this conversion factor is valid whether it's right side up or upside down. If that's equal to one, then that's equal to one, right? You just flip them, it's still equal to one, right? So if you need a conversion factor and it's flipped the wrong way, just flip it over. It's still equal to one. Right? So miles per gallon, if you multiply that times, let's see, to Atlanta is like uh, 385 miles for me. If you multiply that times that, you get miles squared. That doesn't help you. So you just flip your mileage, miles per gallon, over. So if you get uh, 24 miles per gallon, you just flip it over. One gallon, is 24 miles. Now miles cancels and leaves you with gallons. Okay. Did I lose anybody? <laughs> okay. Now that you know how many gallons you have to buy, you need to know the price. How much does it cost? Well, that's an estimate, definitely. Because it may cost you what? Uh, uh, 250 here, if you're lucky, maybe 260, buy a gallon of gas. But you, as soon as you cross over, if I'm going to Atlanta, I cross over into Virginia, the price drops about a quarter a gallon or 30 cents a gallon. You know? So I had just enough gas in my tank to get me across the border, then I fill up. But then your value then is you're converting gallons, so you need, right? How much per gallon? Then that tells you the final answer. How much money do I need? Squirrel away. 
so that I can make it back. And then I usually add about 10%. I might want to do a little driving around. Or when I get to Atlanta, price might be five bucks a gallon. No, I, I'll know that in advance because I have this little app on my phone called. Uh, travel, travel, travel. Gas buddy. And what people do is um, you put that app on your phone, and when you buy gas somewhere, you punch in the numbers and say, This is where I am, this is what it costs. And if you get enough people doing it, often enough, then you know what the price is at a certain place. So it's, you can find the cheapest in your area. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Um, temperature. There are three basic systems. Down at last, uh, more than three, but these are the important ones. Fahrenheit for weather, Celsius for actually making the measurements in the lab, and then Kelvin for doing calculations. Because there, there are many calculations in chemistry that require Kelvin as your temperature. Explain that to you later, but you need to know how to make the conversion. Celsius to Kelvin is easy. I'll make this point again. When you're measuring the temperature of something, it's just like measuring my height. If I say I'm six feet tall, that's the same as 72 inches. My height hadn't changed. Well, the temperature hadn't changed either. It's just you're using different units, right? So if the if the whatever that red stuff is. In your thermometers now. Mm -hmm. No, they don't use mercury anymore. I wish they did. <laughs> yeah, I wish they did because mercury is more accurate. Um, anyway, wherever that thing gets to is the same temperature no matter what scale you're using. Right? Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, doesn't matter. Still going to go to the same place. It's just the scale that changes. Right? So we need a way to relate those scales. Celsius and Kelvin are um, uh, easy, right? Uh, Kelvin, the zero point on Kelvin is absolute zero. That is, there is absolutely no molecular motion at zero Kelvin. Now that's theoretical. We're never going to get there. Well, there's some chemists that claim they've gotten there, but they do it by cheating. They take, they take. Um, molecules or atoms that are coming at them this way and they fire a laser at it with just enough energy to stop it. And theoretically, if it's not moving, it's at zero K. But actually reaching zero K for bulk matter, you'll never get there. Because how do you cool something down? You transfer heat from this place to that place. And the only way you can transfer from here to here is if this is colder than that. Right? That's how our conditioning works. So if you want to go to zero here, what temperature, what sink do you need to go to to, to take that heat away from it and make it zero? There is none. There's nothing less than zero. Right? So you're never going to get to zero K by conventional. But we have a, a theoretical zero point. Let's put it that way. We have gone down to as close as four degrees, not degrees, excuse me. K doesn't have degrees. It's just four K. Four K is about as low as you can go. And that's like uh, either liquid helium or liquid hydrogen or that cold. Um, so you have to use a huge refrigeration unit like the size of this room and pump the heat out of something like this to get it to go down that low. Okay, so that's Kelvin. It's based on zero, absolute zero. Um, zero for Celsius is the freezing point of water. And 100 for Celsius is the boiling point of water. Okay, so that's, that makes sense to a chemist because 
if you want to calibrate your thermometer, all you need is pure water at one atmosphere pressure, freeze it, measure your thermometer, mark that zero. If your zero is a little off, you can make adjustments. Then boil the water, you know, boil pure water at one atmosphere pressure, that's important. And you can mark it on your thermometer as 100. And if it's off by a little bit, you make those adjustments to calibrate your thermometer. For Fahrenheit, that's a little different. Uh, Fahrenheit was a German, and he was involved with a uh, living system. So he wanted zero and 100 at something that was related to living system. Well, he sort of fudged a little bit. Zero for Fahrenheit is the coldest temperature he could come up. So he took distilled water and ice and um, no, distilled water and uh, salt. Salt and ice, like made an ice cream freezer. Coldest temperature he could come up with was his zero point. Okay. So that's why the freezing point of water in the Fahrenheit system is 32. Right. It's, it's above that cold point that he was able to establish with uh, salt on ice. But his 100 degree point was uh, in the neighborhood of living system, right? 98.6 for humans, you know, 103 for cats and dogs. So he sort of averaged them out. <laughs> I had a physics professor that told me, told the whole class. What Fahrenheit did was, he had his thermometer, and he did something wrong. His wife was pissed at him. She was just boiling mad, you know, flushed, stuck the thermometer in her mouth and went up to 100. <laughs> but you can convert from one to the other. Now, it's easy to go from Celsius to Kelvin. You just say uh, Kelvin temperature, if you know what centigrade or Celsius is, Degrees centigrade plus two seven three. That's it. Because the, the size of the degree is exactly the same for both, so you just have to move the zero point. Fahrenheit, on the other hand, is a different size degree, it's a smaller degree. It's almost half the size of a Celsius degree. So you've got to make two corrections there. Let's see if I've got it up here. Uh, yeah. So there's your Kelvin temperature. I just write the K and the C. Temperature, Kelvin, temperature, C. So if you want to go backwards, it's like any formula, right? You can solve it for the unknowns. So if you want to solve for C, we just say K minus 273, right? We just say this from that side becomes negative on this side, and there it is. Okay. So simple conversion. Um, for uh, converting to from, uh, centigrade to Fahrenheit, the one I remember is Fahrenheit equals nine fifths centigrade plus thirty-two. Now up there, they convert nine fifths to a decimal fraction. This is equal to one point eight. I like nine fifths better because it allows me to estimate. 1.8 doesn't mean anything. Nine fifths, yeah. I could say, all right, centigrade is say 20. 23 centigrade. What's five of that is four. What's nine times of that? 36, right? Plus 32 is 68. So I know that 20 degrees centigrade is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Then for every um, five degrees change in centigrade, you get nine degrees change in Fahrenheit. So if I say if 68 is 20, then if I go up five degrees here, I gotta go up nine degrees there. So that's 77. So 25 is 77. So I can estimate just like that quickly. I need to see you go. <laughs> I was enthralled by the topic. Did I miss something important? No.
which is conversion. Converting from uh, Kelvin, from centigrade to Kelvin, you just add 273 to centigrade, you get Kelvin. Um, if you go uh, Fahrenheit, you want Fahrenheit, you've got centigrade, you just say 9 fifths or 1.8 times centigrade plus 32. So this adjusts the zero point, right? 32 degrees freezing point of water. And then this adjusts for the size of the degree. Right? For every nine um, Fahrenheit, you move five centigrade. So the centigrade degree is about like that, and the Fahrenheit degree is about like that, the difference in their size. Um, if you want to know the derivation of this formula, just go to that website. It's got a really good description. We need to memorize all these, right? Actually, I put those on the exam. Thanks, good. Yeah. <laughs> right, I, that's why I asked. <laughs> I, had, I had this thing at the end called useful information, <laughs> and it will have the formula there. Cool. But, if you do what I said the first time we met, you know, work problems to your boards did, right. then we'll have a you'll automatically plan. memorize it. You won't have any choice. But if you need to go the other direction, you just solve for this one, right? Uh, Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8 or times 5 ninths. So it's like, it's like any algebraic formula. If you've got a formula in one unknown, you can solve for it. Right? If you got two unknowns, then you either got to find out what one of those unknowns is, or have two simultaneous equations. Then you can solve for it. That's just algebra. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe the dog is 102. I don't see the bed panicking if, if they get 103. But 102 is supposedly normal. So what's the equivalent to the Kelvin temperature in that scale? What do you need to do? Yeah? Not yet, because that's very nice. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Convert to centigrade. Yeah. Then yeah. convert to Kelvin. Right. It's a two-step process. Now, you could theoretically combine equations. Right? If you know uh, K equals C plus 273, and you know that F equals uh, 9 fifths C plus 32. And you want to go to Kelvin. Then all you need is to solve for centigrade. Plug it in there. And then you would have Fahrenheit on this side, Kelvin on that side. You could plug your Fahrenheit in, do it in one step. Right. But you don't have to do it that way. You can flip this around so you get centigrade, right? solve for centigrade, then plug it in there and get Kelvin. Okay. Right. So I'll show you how it's done here. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. At what numerical value is centigrade equal to Fahrenheit? Because since they have different degrees, if you plot the slope of those two lines, they cross at some point, which means they're equal. So you just set centigrade equal to Fahrenheit, and you call it X or whatever you want, it doesn't matter. And then you plug them in together. Right? So at what temperature? Minus 40. So minus 40 centigrade is equal to minus 40 Fahrenheit. I used to work in a hotel and restaurant supply house uh, in Atlanta. And we had uh, coolers and freezers because we stored meat and then perishable stuff. And one of the freezers was like zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's for long term storage. But we had one that was minus 20. It's called our blast freezer. So that's where we, we make hamburger patties. Put them on the trays, throw them in there. In like 15 to 20 minutes, they were 
rock solid. But that still wasn't as cold as that. <laughs> I, the only thing I hated about it was doing inventory. You had to go in there. And yeah. Stay. So they had these big insulated, muffy things you put on your head, and you had these big coats that went all the way to the ground that were insulated. And then you had gloves. Well, the gloves were a little hard to deal with because you're trying to take inventory, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we would go in for maybe 15 minutes at a time, max come out and by that time well you go into the cooler and then into the freezer and when you come out of the freezer into the cooler it felt like summer <laughs> <laughs> and since I was the I had lower seniority I got to do the last piece <laughs> <laughs> but they did feed us oh. on days when we did inventory we had breakfast because we'd start really early and we have oh man we have uh, hash browns grits sausage Bacon, eggs, scrambled eggs, orange juice. All the good stuff. Yeah, they, they all came from our inventory, right? Because we were a hotel restaurant supply. So the, the boss would just write it off on, on the business expense. And we pack on the calories, you know, when we had to go in the cooler. <laughs> okay. I think this is the last topic for this chapter density. Uh, and the point here is that um, when you have a formula, like this one, for instance, density equals mass per unit volume. When you have a formula like that, you can use it, like I said before, if you know two of the, any two of those values, you can find the third. Because right? there are three unknowns, and if we know this one and that one, we can find this one. Of course, by definition, if you want to know the density of something, you have a certain volume of it, find out what its mass is, plug it in, and find the density. So you can either plug in the values that you know and solve for the unknown, or you can solve for the unknown and then plug the values. Right? So mass would then would be density times volume. Volume then would be mass divided by density. So all those three are equivalent. Just depends on if you know these two, then use that one. You know these two, use that one. I prefer just to memorize one and then manipulate it as I need. But this is um, an example of an intensity factor. Intensity versus capacity. In, so, in short, intensity is a is a, uh, um, a property of matter which does not change no matter how much of it you have. Right. So the density of a chunk of gold or a gold coin will be the same as the density of a gold bar. Doesn't change. Capacity is like mass. If you have the gold bar, it definitely has more mass than the gold coin. That's a capacity factor. Usually, intensity factors are ratios of two units. Right? This would be like uh, grams per cubic centimeter, or grams per milliliter. Whereas capacity would be a single word, like mass uh, equals um, milligrams. That's not always the case. One notable exception is temperature. Temperature is an intensity factor. Because if you have this much boiling water or that much boiling water, the temperature is still the same. OK. Uh, density, density. There's calculations with density. There should be some density calculation examples that you work in your homework. That'll give you practice. And then, of course, in Blackboard, remember I've got those review documents. So if you look at the review, at least look at the review document once. The reason I say that is the exams look exactly like the review documents. Okay. 
So they give you a feel for what type of questions I ask, what the format is. Uh, they'll have the uh, useful information on the last pages. And uh, beginning with chapter four, we'll have a periodic table there. You see, it's a little bit different than this one. So you may want to look at it to get familiar with the things because it has more information in that version of the periodic table than this one does. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's it for that chapter. Yeah, let me pause this before I jump into the next one. Because I write something on the board. I'll technically remember the numbers that I did. It only has one statistical thing. It's big thing. And I think I can mind up there. Yeah. And I, that's what I ran into. This is like one statistical number. Okay, yes. there we go. So I did that right. That's right. Uh -huh. and just making sure because it has three numbers in that one, I was wondering if I can round to the zero. But if it had one, one, six, eight, that's what I ran into. Right. Um, just making sure I did it right. That, that makes I sure that. Yeah, okay. if, if you're not steeped in science, there's a there's an internal resistance to doing that. It's like, ooh, I'm throwing away that information. Yeah, that's what I felt but, like. Uh, the rule says you got to do it. <laughs> well, the, the way you put the uh, way you talk is it's very clear. Like, you know, it's like you said, you know, you have to read it of matter. Matter is the stuff that occupies space and has mass. Basic definition. We're going to study matter in terms of only three different states that can go through different phases. So physical changes for, uh, for instance, water. Uh, as a solid, of course, it's ice. And then as a liquid, it's what we normally call water. And then uh, when it vaporizes, we might call it steam or water vapor. Okay, so it goes through solid, liquid, gas. It's still water, right? Ice, uh, liquid, and gas, it's still water. Water hadn't changed. Right? The chemistry is still the same. It's just going through some physical changes. Um, matter can exist in uh, other states. In other words, for instance, um, in the atmosphere of the sun, matter is plasma. Plasma is ionized gas. Right? So, but it takes extreme environmental conditions, and we're not interested in those. Right? So we're going to stick with just three phases. Solid, liquid, and gas. We just need to define what those are. Right? So a solid is something that is a form of matter that can hold its own shape, like you sit it on the table, and it doesn't flow. It just sits there with its own shape, plus it has its, a defined volume. Right? The liquid form would ha still have the same volume, or pretty close to the same volume as the solid, but it would not be able to hold its own shape. So as the ice cube melts, it just goes everywhere, unless you have it in a container. And then it assumes the shape of the container. So a liquid has an indefinite shape, but still has a definite volume. And then the gas, of course, um, by the time we reach gas, we've lost the ability to hold shape and volume. So if you put a gas into a vessel, it will expand to fill that volume. <clears throat> yes, the density will change. Not so much from solid to liquid, although there are 
measurable changes, but the really significant change in density is from liquid to gas. Okay. That's everything I just said. <laughs> Let's see. Phys okay, physical properties. <clears throat> a physical property describes a characteristic of matter. Um, that can change without changing its composition. And the implication there is that we're not changing the chemistry of the matter. In other words, we're not converting it into a different substance. We're only changing the phase. Or the form, I should say, because you can still have the same phase and have a different form. For instance, you can have a chunk of sandstone, like this block that you're gonna maybe uh, put on a facade or build a wall, or you can grind it up and make sand out of it. Okay, the physical change is just particle size, right? But it's still sand. We haven't changed its uh, chemical composition. And we haven't changed its phase either. It's still a solid. Um, so this physical property is um, usually a characteristic that you can observe directly. For instance, um, odor would be a property. So it would be maybe pungent, it would be uh, sweet, it would be um, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Odor comes in many forms. Color, change the color. Uh, it's, a, it's an expression of uh, a physical characteristic. Volume, state, density would be a physical property. It's what is it right now? You know, what does it smell like? What's its color? What's its density right now? At what temperature does it boil? Well, if it's boiling, measure it water 100 degrees. Physical property. Chemical property, on the other hand, describes the ability of the substance to change into a new substance. So examples, sometimes it's better to go with examples here. So if we describe something as flammable, that means it can change from this substance to that substance by burning. So if you, if you uh, have natural gas in your house, turn on the stove, the gas comes in, we mix it with air, it burns and makes heat. And then what do you have left over? Usually carbon dioxide and water. So that flammability is a chemical property. Something that firemen like to know. Um, steel rust, that's a chemical property. Steel changes from this substance to that substance because of the rusting property. In other words, it will oxidize in air. There used to be a building in Atlanta called it the Omni. Some architect got the bright idea. There's a new material on the market, they were thinking to themselves. It's called um, rusting steel. Really? You know, that's not new. Steel always rusts, unless it's stainless. Said, no, 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 no. This steel, when it rusts, it rusts so fast that it steals the surface of the steel so that more air can't get to it, because you need air for rust to happen, right? So, yeah, great idea to convince somebody to build this building. Okay, so it did its thing. I saw the building, they built the building, and within a week, it was uh, brick red. The outside, it rusted, and it sealed off and stopped rusting. Well, Atlanta's in the south, it's in that uh, maritime zone, and storms come through, right? Rain, okay, so here comes the big rainstorm. Next day, 
there's there are red streaks all over the country. <laughs> they didn't count on the water. Yeah, it keeps the, the oxygen out, right? But the water just comes in and, and that stuff is all over the concrete. It's ugly. Eventually they tore the building down. And eventually if it keeps coming off the land and rust is coming into the rust all right. the way through. That too. <laughs> but that's a chemical property of steel. It rusts. Uh, digestion of food is, is a really that's a chemical property of, of food when it comes into contact with uh, your digestive system. So that's a little that's a stretch because there are a lot of chemical properties involved there. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're going to chew it, break it, make it smaller particle size, and then the um, uh, what's the name? Like acidity and all that. Uh, the first enzyme it comes into contact is from your salivary glands that work on starch. Uh, I have tip of my tongue. I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> but it goes to work on starch immediately, you're breaking the starch down from sugars. Uh, and then, of course, makes it way down to your stomach, and the pH of your stomach acid is between one and two. And the, you do acidic uh, hydrolysis of many of the compounds. Plus your stomach is like churning. Have you ever seen an internal, like a run a camera, yeah. and, and watch the stomach, it's going through these things like that. Ooh, well, that looks weird. That's what you're getting done. My and my brother wanted to be a surgeon for a while. Then we watch videos of actual surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, we can talk about that forever. Um, let's see if we can uh, classify these as physical or chemical properties. Okay. Ethyl alcohol boils at 78 degrees. Physical, yep. Hardness of diamond. That's physical. In fact, diamond is the hardest naturally occurring substance. On the Mohs scale, it's 10. It's 10, right. It's the hardest. And then the, on that scale, the least hard is 1, which is talc. <laughs> uh, sugar fermenting to form ethyl alcohol. Chemical property. Okay. Now, those were properties. If we just actually describe the process of the change, um, it could either be described as a physical change or a chemical change. Okay. So when we change the form of a substance, but not its chemical composition, we're describing a physical change. So if we're going to boil water, water boils uh, to go from liquid to vapor phase, or it goes from liquid to solid phase, we're describing a physical change. So that, in my mind, requires that you understand that there's something here and it becomes something here. Not just what is it now, but what does it become. And uh, when, you, when you describe a physical change, you're saying it goes from liquid to solid or to gas. How'd that happen? Chemical change. Uh, so we're going to change the substance that goes through a chemical change has completely different properties after the change. For instance, the burner on your stove or a Bunsen burner in the laboratory is a way of controlling the combustion of the natural gas. So we combine it with oxygen and it makes carbon dioxide water produce heat. So the change that it undergoes, the chemical property would be flammability, but the chemical change would be going from methane oxygen to carbon dioxide water. This little device this computer. We're recording again. Okay.
think it's a search. All right, where were we? Uh, electrolysis. So what we've done here is this is a chemical change because we have two different substances where we started with one, water. We ended up with two gases, hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen collects at, at one electrode and oxygen at the other. I don't have one of these here, but I used to have one that and, uh, taught for a year at a private school in Georgia. And we actually had one of those. So I could set it up as a demonstration and collect hydrogen in one side, and then I'd take a test tube and open the stopcock and let it, right, because hydrogen is lighter than air, so it'd flow up into the tube, and I just hold it like that. And then I have a, a lit match or a, a, a glowing ember, put it over here, and it goes off and pop. Oh, that's so cool. So we, aha science. <laughs> So that represents a chemical change. We're decomposing water, right? We take two of them, then we get two oxygens, which is the way oxygen uh, is naturally, the diatomic element. And by the way, this, um, you'll see on here, the ones that are in blue, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are all diatomics. So if you read a word problem that says uh, oxygen combines with hydrogen, when you write the formula, which you don't know now, but you will, you have to write H2 plus O2. Otherwise, your equation will never balance. But don't worry about that now. We'll cover that later. This just shows that you, you're undergoing chemical change through the intervention of electric current, and you're making oxygen and hydrogen, whereas you had water before. They're completely different substances. So a chemical change has occurred. Um, well, of all these, only burning wood is the chemical change. We're changing cellulose, basically, the lignin, but cellulose, into carbon dioxide and water, and then there's always some ash left over. Heard of wood ash? Don't put too much wood ash on your garden. It'll burn your plants. So you throw it in your compost pile and let it mix around. But uh, pulverizing rock salt, that's a physical change. Dissolving sugar in water is a physical change. You still got sugar and you still got water, no change there. Melting a popsicle on a warm summer day. <laughs> yep, that's a physical change. Mm-hmm. Got to eat it fast. <laughs> and then what do you get? Oh, Ice cream and, headache. And a <laughs> Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you get it all over you. <laughs> okay. Fermenting. Chemical change. Iron metal melting. Physical change. Iron combining with oxygen to form rust. Chemical change. Okay, what is an element? Um, the first scientific definition of an element came from Robert Boyle. We'll talk about him later again. He, was, he did experiments with gases. But he was also, um, in those days, they called it natural philosophy. But it was chemistry, physics, and whatever else you wanted to do. And uh, he said that an element was a substance that could not be simplified any further uh, by physical or chemical means. So you, you usually use physical means to separate things the best you could. Then you would take one fraction of that, once it was as pure as you could get it physically, and then you would apply chemical agents to it to break it apart. And they had several at their disposable, as disposal heat, acids, so forth. And they would break it apart into smaller pieces, uh, like electrolysis. And you couldn't you couldn't break it apart any further by chemical means. That was his definition of an element. And in most cases, it worked.
Um, and these are examples. Iron, which the element, the uh, symbol for iron is Fe. Does that make any sense? Okay. Actually, it's Latin. The Latin for iron is ferrum, but we use Fe. A plus, instead of saying IR, or I, I was already taken for iodine. And uh, IR, which is iridium somewhere. I don't know where I want to go under. Iridium. So instead of saying IR for that one, you couldn't use one. You can't be in chemistry and sciences in general. Anything you do has to be unambiguous. In other words, if it's this, it can't be anything else. Okay. So we had to call iron something else. We call it ferrum. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How many languages have um, uh, gotten the same method? Do they, do they use Japanese language from different? Nope. Do they use English letters? They use these letters. Ah, because it's all in English, mostly Latin. So English or Latin, usually. Uh, zinc, of course, we can, that's like from the English, uh, gallium, aluminum, aura, carbon. The first ones that are identified are usually given one symbol, capital symbol. If uh, B is already taken, so bromine has to add another little R. And then, of course, sometimes you'll get the, the Latin folk, like uh, tungsten, W is for wolfram, or lead, plumbum. Which in Latin means heavy. So that was appropriate. Uh, argentum for silver, aurum for gold. Um, there are several others. Italian uh, for potassium, uh, natrium for sodium. Those are Latins. Really a lot of words, but probably don't have like high those as well. Yeah. Try to link it back together. Okay. Whatever helps you in your Exactly. I mean, if, if all of our brains were exactly alike, like computers, then one method would work for everybody. Yeah, I think eventually these template cells can stop and then people find new things. Yeah. You all get to look at the same stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, mixtures. So let me back up because I think I went too far. Pure substances. Okay. A pure substance. Well, okay, let me back up some more. I must have hit more buttons than I thought. Okay, there's your elements. Elements can combine into compounds. Two or more elements together can make a compound. If it is a new substance with new properties, then it, it uh, can be classified as a compound. But compounds have to have at least two different elements. They can have two or more. If it has uh, two atoms together of the same element, it's not a compound. It might be like F2. That's an element. So we got one type of atom there. So compounds have to have two or more different elements together. Um, let's see. All of these substances are compounds. They have two or more elements together. So they're, they're compounds. A pure substance is something that uh, always has the same composition, no matter where it comes from. But it doesn't have any other substance mixed in with it. For instance, pure water. We distill water several times over and over again. Eventually, you get nothing but water. Nothing else is, is there, just the water. That's a pure substance. And it's represented by the formula for the compound. 
Um, but a pure substance can also be an element. Right? So you can have a compound, or you can have any one of these elements, whether it's diatomic or monatomic, or some of them are even more, like uh, sulfur, comes in different forms. It can be S4, it can be SA. But those, if, if there's nothing else in there but that compound or element, it's a pure substance. Okay. The reason we need to define pure substances is because then we can define mixtures. So water, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, gold, they all represent pure substances. Now mixtures, if you get two or more pure substances physically combined, there's no chemical reaction involved. You just mix them together and they're occupying uh, the same space. Then you have a mixture. You can have more than two, but at least two gives you a mixture. Now, the variable composition refers to uh, this pure substance in the mixture is one composition, like water, H2O. This comp uh, Mix, uh, substance, pure substance that you put in water is still that substance like uh, table sugar, but it has a different composition than water. That's why they say variable composition, because the different pure substances have different compositions. Uh, those are just some examples. Uh, one characteristic, one um, property, and it's a physical property of a mixture, is that it can be separated by physical means into its individual pure substances. For instance, sugar water. How would you separate the sugar from the water? Well, you can do it without changing the water to something else or changing the sugar to something. You can heat it, boil off the water, and you got the sugar left. And if you want to catch the water, you just put something over it. Water condenses on that, drips down the side, and you catch the water. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Are any mixtures on the periodic table? No. That's what I was saying, pure and what was the other? Those are all pure substances. They're elements. Yeah. Uh, that's the only thing in the periodic table. That makes it easy. <laughs> There are too many uh, potential compounds and pure substances mm -hmm. to put them in the table. Now you can make tables from pure substances. Um, you want to write a novel. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or you want to write a, a handbook like the uh, uh, CRC handbook. Oh, which they, one? Do you have one? I don't have one, but I've heard about it. I bet your brother has one. <laughs> CRC handbook. It started out. About that wide, about that thick. I've got a copy. And that it was decades ago. I don't know how I ended up with it, but it's got the, the gold foil around the edge of the pages. Oh, you know? yeah. And now the CRC handbook is like that, like that, like that. In fact, it's electronic, <laughs> so it's searchable, which is nice. <laughs> But it has lists of pure substances because um, it also lists with those pure substances physical properties of the substances. Oh. Boiling points, melting points, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, two types of mixtures. If um, if the mixture is such that you can sample from any place in the mixture, and the ratio of the pure substances is always identical. That's a homogeneous mixture. Another name for homogeneous mixture is solution. Uh, example of a solution would be like salt water. You put salt in water, where'd it go? It's in solution. 
dummy, right? <laughs> it's the same throughout. You cannot distinguish one part of the solution from the other, or the homogeneous mixture from the other. As far as its uh, ratio of pure substances. Okay. Um, homogeneous mixtures don't necessarily have to be a solid dissolved in a liquid, like our example, sugar water, salt water. Any type of mixture is valid. Gases, we're breathing a homogeneous mixture of primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. And that's characteristic, uh, a characteristic with gases is you put two or more gases together, they always form a homogeneous mixture solution every time. They, rarely you can say that. There are no exceptions. Two or more gases together always form a solution. The reason being, there's lots of space between the molecules. No room for everybody. Right? So they mix perfectly. Homogeneous mixture. Brass is a homogeneous mixture, a solution of copper and nickel primarily. Okay? You can't mix the solid copper and nickel together. They just won't go. So you have to heat them up and mix them. And then when they solidify, there's still a solution. Uh, heterogeneous mixtures. Any place you look in a heterogeneous mixture, you're going to find a different ratio of your pure substances. That's heterogeneous. Uh, perfect example, my PhD is in soil science. Soils. It's just when you say soil, you just think heterogeneous. <laughs> so when, we, when I did research with soil uh, and tried to pick an area for doing my field plot techniques, I tried to pick a uniform, as uniform an area as possible. Because differences in soil will cause differences in yield from the crops that I try to grow there. <laughs> but any place you look in that soil, there are going to be slight differences. It's just the way it is. Uh, sand. You try to stir sand into water. Right? As long as you're stirring it really hard, you might think it's homogeneous. But the second you stop, you know that it's heterogeneous. Oil and vinegar, making your salad dressing. You ever make your own salad dressing? Yeah, I like those little, um, what they call them, those uh, sliced chip beef containers oh. made by Armor. They have the little snap caps on them. So once you use the chip beef to make your SOS, you can pour your oil in there, pour some vinegar in there, throw some spices in there. The easiest way is to put them in dash. Mm -hmm. Snap the cap on and you shake it like crazy. <laughs> and then you put it on your salad as quick as possible because it's going to instantly start to separate. But that is a heterogeneous mixture because, because oil and water don't mix. Okay. Which one of these is a homogeneous mixture? Okay. Let me back up. Whenever you have a word problem, you, you have to understand from the very beginning that word problems are meant to confuse. They're trying to tease out of the, the student um, whether or not the student understands the, the system that's being described and the question that's being asked about the system. So you have to be able to do one of First thing you do is what's the question? Once you know what the question is, then you can look at the word problem and dig out the information that's relevant because word problems are not notorious for throwing a lot of blue smoke in your face. Okay, so in this case, 
Which of the following is a homogeneous mixture? What's the question? Well, the first question is, which one's a mixture? Right? That's not a mixture. That's not a mixture. So you can eliminate those two right off the bat. Then you ask yourself, which one is homogeneous? Right? I just told you soil wasn't. Right? We throw that one out. Uh, jelly beans, you know that's not homogeneous because all you got to do is look at the colors. And you see red bunched up over here and green bunched up over there. You know that's not homogeneous. So really, by process of elimination, this is the only one that could be homogeneous. And gasoline is. It's primarily octane, which is a hydrocarbon, with little bits of heptane and cyclohexane some additives that the company's put in there to convince you that it's good for your engine. But that's the only one that's a homogeneous mixture for our solution. And we did it by process of elimination. We asked ourselves the questions. And very often the best way to approach um, a word problem is the same way you approach <laughs> reading a government document. You start at the end. <laughs> okay, so if we want to separate mixtures, mixtures are separable by physical means. Okay, so for um, if we want to separate things based on their boiling points, it's a process called distillation. So you can distill your mash and get the ethanol out of it. And I guess as long as the revenueers don't come around, you can sell it as white lightning. Of course, when you distill it, the first fraction that comes off, you better throw that away. The first fraction that comes off is methanol, wood alcohol. That's the one that makes you go blind. Okay. So you throw that out. Then you collect the ethanol. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, are you a distiller on the side? <laughs> um, so um, if we if we have a mixture that is that maintains different states of matter, right, then you can separate them by filtration. Because usually the states are different particle sizes. Not always, but, but usually. And filtration is one way to separate. Um, for instance, uh, what do they do in the mines? I mean, if the mine inspector comes around, what are they going to do? They're going to go in there with this device. It's got a little fan on it. It sucks air in and blows it through a filter. And then they take that filter and put it in a little plastic bag and take it back to the lab, count particles. If it has more than a certain number of particles, uh, after they run the fan for so long, they know they pulled in, it's calibrated, they pulled in so many cubic feet of air through that filter, and they know based on the cubic feet of air how many particles they have, and they can do a concentration calculation. And if it exceeds a certain amount, shut the line down. So that's a separation based on filtration. Uh, chromatography is. Um, very useful method, only it's a broad field. It started out on paper, right? I can't remember the guy's name, but extracted with methanol, extracted plant material, and put dots on a piece of paper of that extraction. And then uh, dip the, the bottom of it in some, uh, some more methanol. And immediately the methanol started migrating up the paper. And he noticed that as it went, these dots started to change color. They separated with different dots of different color. Then the greens and reds and yellows. And that was the first chromatography. Chromatography means chroma, which is color, and graph, which means to write. So it's color writing. Um, now chromatography can be almost anything. We used to use an, uh, a device, 
a piece of equipment in the lab I, I retired from called high pressure liquid chromatography. It had a column of stainless steel. Packed in there was uh, very, very fine microscopic particles. And we had mobile phase, which was pumped through there under high pressure. And then you would inject your sample into that mobile phase and it would travel through the, the column. And it would spend time on the solid phase that was in there, uh, partitioned between the mobile phase and the solid phase. And the longer that your chemical, your compound, spent on the solid phase, the longer it takes to get through. Because you know, it's going backwards and forwards. It spends more time on the solid phase, it stays there longer. So the ones that don't spend much time on the solid phase, they get flushed out first. And you have a detector on the on the other end to get a peak that comes out. So when something new comes out, it goes, whoosh. something else comes out, whoosh. you know, gives you this uh, graph of peaks. Anyway, chromatography is a is very broad field. If you have something that's particularly volatile, say you have a mixture of something that, that has uh, one fraction of it is very volatile, all you have to do is just slightly heat it up and it'll just turn off and leave the, the less volatile one behind. Evaporation. Or if it's non volatile altogether, like salt water. Just evaporate off the water and you got salt there. Okay. Um, this is what a, a distillation apparatus looks like at laboratory side. So you so you can heat your stuff up here. It goes up here and it happens at a certain temperature. So you can watch the temperature here. If they have two things in there, it doesn't have to be salt. So you have two things that um, are volatile. But one is more volatile than the other. The first one's going to come off at a temperature, and it reads off on the thermometer at a temperature, say 30 degrees centigrade. And then once that's all the way over, then the other one starts coming off. And the temperature will go like 30 degrees, 30 degrees, and it'll go like 50 degrees. That's your second fraction coming off. When that happens, you take this one out, stick a new one in there, and you can catch your fraction. Yeah. They should do that in an organic chemistry lab. They would give you a, a mixture of two or more substances in this little bottle. You have to separate them. So we do fractional distillation, and then you take your individual fractions that you separated and characterize them by various things. Try to identify what the compound is. That's the one place I got to see. Because I guess the professor thought I was cheap. Yeah, one of my compounds had uh, uh, oxidized. It was an aldehyde, and it oxidized to a, a carboxylic acid, which is insoluble, so it, it settled on the bottom. So I, I filtered it out, took that carboxylic acid, and I, I mixed it in with potassium chloride, you know, smashed it, put it in my infrared spectrometer, did a, got a spectrum of it. And I said, okay, if this is the carboxylic acid, identified that, then it had to come from this aldehyde. So I worked backwards and said, okay, if that, then this. I, I got the compound right. I just didn't go, I didn't go through all the steps. Oh, my brother gets told that all the time. Yeah. He's one of those things. We just do something naturally and then you're right across. Yeah. And they don't have to be you on the stove side for a while. And then you get a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. Do it right. Oh, well, that's okay. It's a learning experience. <laughs> and it was only a lab, so it wasn't worth a lot of uh, credit points that messed up my average. But it did take a lot of time. It was like from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. one night a week. Really? Yeah. So we'd be in the lab for four hours and we'd start off with an hour of lecture preparing us for the lab. And then we'd go in the lab for four hours to do our work. And they'd have to let us out. Of, they'd have to let us out of the building because they they locked it down after after I nine o'clock. Yeah. But I was working full time, so that was the only time I could do it. Yeah. Gosh, try to drive yourself. It was fun. Uh, in this 
in the in the lab, there were uh, graduate students that had their projects going too. Right? It was a big lab. So we would have our section over here, but we could see what they were doing. And uh, uh, they were they were synthetic organic chemistry was one of their projects. And they were making compounds. But when you when you do organic reactions, you get a lot of side reactions. They make stuff that you don't want. So you got to separate the stuff you want from the stuff you don't want. So they use these huge uh, columns, glass columns filled with packing like that column I talked about earlier. Uh, but it would just be gravity fed. So they would put their reaction uh, stuff up here and gradually drip a mobile phase and it would go down like that. And then they would catch the, the fraction individually at the bottom. And one of those fractions would be the compound they wanted. So they do that column chromatography, they call it. Sometimes you could see it if the compound was colored, you could see it moving. Sometimes you couldn't. So at the bottom, what you would have is a detector, usually an ultraviolet light detector. And it would it would be set to trigger. So when it sees something coming, it starts to see something coming, it would automatically stick a tube up and catch it until the signal decreased to a certain amount, then you move the tube out. <clears throat> they call it fraction collectors. Okay, so you can filter, right? If there's a difference in particle size, you can filter. Okay, this is just an organization tool. If you like flow charts, fine, if you don't. But if you start with matter, you could have either a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture, possibly. You could also have a pure substance. It doesn't have to be a mixture. And you can separate your mixtures by physical means. A physical process will separate them into pure substance. Either one. Or you could have pure substances already. But if you want to separate your pure substances into uh, You can break down your pure substance into multiple compounds, right? You could take uh, uh, sugar and you could uh, react it or burn it and you end up with carbon dioxide water. They're still compounds, but they're pure substance. So with carbon dioxide water, all you would have to do is to uh, run the, the products through a condenser that was cold. Water would condense and the gas would go on through and separate. But to get the pure substances uh, into this the compound form requires chemical reaction, right? a chemical change. Or you could take the pure substance directly to elements. So that's the key. If you go from one to the other, if you go from compound to element, you have to use <coughs> chemical means. Because we're going to find out that in order to make a chemical change, you have to break bonds. Bonds that hold elements together in a compound have to be broken. That's a chemical reaction. That's a chemical change. That's it. So what? That was all of the stuff on matter? Yeah. For the basic stuff? Mm-hmm. And then we'll get to play around.